Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to a new episode of Chatting with Lady C. Hi mom, how are you? I'm well, thank you, honey, and you? I'm very well, thank you. Oh, good. Yeah. What do you have in store for us today? So today we're going to be talking about various questions on different subjects, and just to keep it a little bit going, getting people's um, questions out there and replying back to them with mom. Okay, honey, so thank you. First question? No worries. So our first question for today is... Did you know Barbara Cartland? If so, what was she like? Did you also know her daughter, Rain, Countess Spencer? She has often been accused of being heartless and ambitious. Was she? Oh, yes, I did know Barbara rather well. Uh, you may not know who Barbara Cartland was, yeah. but Barbara Cartland is one of the most prolific writers who has ever lived. She wrote nearly 600 books, oh, or maybe even over 600. I know how many she wrote because there was an incident. She was my stepmother-in-law, Margaret, Duchess of Argyll's best friend. Mm -hmm. And I, so I knew her very well as a result of that. She helped me with my first Diana biography. She sent over 50 pages of notes. I've still got them somewhere. Uh, she was a wonderful interviewer. Sorry, she was a wonderful interviewee. Uh, she was very helpful. She told me lots of really interesting stuff that I would otherwise never have known. One of the things she said, that was important was she said Diana was never a bit shy. She said Diana was very conscious of being very tall and that she stooped because she was tall but she was not a bit shy. She was a great entertainer. She, she was, according to Barbara, her daughter Rain was possibly the daughter of Prince George, the previous Duke of Kent, who was King George V's third son, fourth son, fourth son, fourth son. Uh, Rain married, first of all, Gerald Legg, who became Viscount Lewisham, then became Lord Dartmouth, Earl of Dartmouth, uh, then she divorced him and married Johnny Spencer, who was Dan, Princess of Wales's father. And there's a rather entertaining story about uh, when Rain was having an affair with Johnny Spencer because he had a stroke while he was on the job at the Dorchester Hotel. That's how Lord Dartmouth found out that they were having an affair okay. because uh, Rain had to phone for an ambulance. Mm. From his room, I suppose. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, uh, Barbara was an incredible character. She was hyper feminine but a real powerhouse. She believed in loads of vitamins, not exercise, vitamins. She took about 90 vitamins a day. She was a great hostess. She used to have Sunday lunches at Canfield Place and you would arrive and uh, she'd give each of you a copy of her, I suppose, latest book. I've got several of them downstairs somewhere. She was an insuperable snob, Barbara, insuperable snob. She, I remember once going to lunch there when Crown Prince Alexander of Yugoslavia was the guest of honor. And as we walked into the dining room and I, my, I caught the name card, it said, His Majesty King Alexander of Yugoslavia, mm. of course, in those days, Yugoslavia was a communist state and Alexander has never called himself King Alexander. But that's what Barbara was like. She was 
in she she hoped to marry Lord Mountbatten after his wife Edwina died because he had no money at all and Barbara had quite a lot of money because she had this industry going whereby every week she would lie on her chaise long and dictate her latest book to her secretary. I mean, the books were embarrassingly dreadful. Always the same story dressed up with different names. Uh, the wonderful virgin falls in love with a handsome, dashing aristocrat. Mm -hmm. And after a few travails and troubles, all is well at the end of the day. <laughs> so, uh, what else can I say about Barbara? Oh, she, according to Margaret, she was a very good and loyal friend. Mm -hmm. But she, there was a very regrettable incident that happened in 1993, I think it was. No, it must have been 92. Oh, uh, maybe even 91. Anyway, it was just after Margaret had left the Grosvenor house because my stepmother-in-law, Margaret Argyle, ran out of money and had to leave the Grosvenor house where she'd been living since, I think, 78, if I remember correctly. And uh, she moved into Lady David or Goldsmith's maid's apartment in Eaton Mansions. And Barbara was having a foils luncheon. Foils luncheons were huge things that uh, eminent authors would have a foils luncheon. It was a huge deal. And Barbara, the foils was having a luncheon to celebrate Barbara's, the, to celebrate the publication of Barbara's 500th book. That's how I know she wrote at least 500 books. Margaret was asked, and Ian Argal, her stepson, who was my brother-in-law, was asked as well, and he hated her. And he had helped his father to divorce her ignominiously. And Margaret, who actually was really rather sweet in her own way, thought, oh, well, Ian is across the room. I'm going to go up and say hello to him, and which she did, and he snubbed her. Mm -hmm. The next thing I knew was Margaret was on the phone to me. Oh, you've got to help me. There's been the most awful falling out with Barbara. Can you phone her up and tell her that I honestly thought I had been asked to the luncheon? I said, what on earth are you talking about? It turned out that Nigel Dempster, who was a vicious gossip columnist, had written a huge story about the fact that Margaret had turned up at this lunch and she had not been asked. Well, Margaret said to me that they had actually phoned her on the morning of the luncheon to say that they were sending a car for her. And she said, well, I have no recollection of having been asked to this. And they said, oh, well, presumably in the confusion between moving from the Grosvenor House to Eaton Mansions, your invitation went astray. We'll send a car for you, which yes. they did. Well, Margaret believed that it was a very mischievous journalist who Used, who used to trade very heavily on the Argyle family generally, and Margaret in particular, selling stories about her, and actually about all of us, it's got to be said. And I actually thought it could be him, or it could be Nigel Dempster, because Nigel knew that Ian hated Margaret, and Nigel could have set up the whole thing because Nigel was equally mischievous. So anyway, I phoned Barbara and I explained to her what had happened. Do you know what Barbara's reaction was? No. <clears throat> Georgie. 
Margaret is a publicity thief. Mm. <laughs> she has stolen all the publicity to celebrate my fifth hundred, five hundredth book. Mm. She is a publicity thief. I said, okay, Barbara, yeah, I get that you're upset. I don't ever want to speak to that woman again. She has stolen my publicity. Mm. I said, Barbara, there are more important things in life than publicity. You're a fine one to talk. You're always saying that you avoid it. She said, but you're always getting it. <laughs> I said, well, I don't want it. Mm. Come on, Barbara, you know, she's one of your oldest friends. No, she said, I never want to have a thing to do with that woman ever again. She has stolen the publicity of my the, uh, she has stolen the publicity, and I want to get it right. She has stolen the publicity of the celebration of my 500th book. <laughs> well, everything was papered over and they ended up being friends. But this tells you quite a bit about Barbara. Well, when she was, she was, she was, she was a publicity hound and she was very famous. And the press knew that they could phone her up and she would always give them a comment because she loved publicity. Mm. So they were always phoning her up. Well, when Diana was marrying Prince Charles, because Diana's stepmother, Rain, was Barbara's daughter, everybody expected Barbara to be asked to the wedding, which she should have been. She was on the invitation list submitted by Diana's father. And I was told by somebody who was present. It's in my first Diana book. I think it might be. In, yes, it is in my first. If not my first, it's definitely my second Diana book. Mm -hmm. Diana took a pen, scratched out Rain's name and said, I'm not having that woman there. She's going to steal my publicity. <laughs> <laughs> or words to that effect. Yes. So both Diana and Barbara were very aware of anybody stealing their publicity. And it was very humiliating for Barbara to not be asked to the wedding. The press made a huge thing about it. But she was a dame of St. John Ambulance, which was a charity that raised money for ambulances. And so she got into her dame's uniform and on the day of the wedding, she was involved with St. John's Ambulance. And that was a very dignified way of covering up for the fact that she hadn't been asked to the wedding. Rain. I only met once or twice. I met her about three times, actually. She was like a battleship in full sail. I mean, I can picture her now sweeping through one of the galleries at Sotheby's, at a reception at Sotheby's, which would have been in the 80s or 90s, maybe in the early 80s. I mean, in a long uh, floral uh, chiffon blue print dress with her hair everywhere. I mean, the hairstyle was at least 12 inches out and high. And, uh, Marie Antoinette. <laughs> very Marie Antoinette, exactly. With our uh, Johnny Spencer, it, he was alive and he died in 92. So he was there, so it had to be in the 80s. Uh, uh, in her wake, like a little canoe, but he was a very big canoe, bobbing up and down in her wake, mm -hmm. and adored her. He absolutely adored her. But she was very ambitious, as was Barbara. The, Barbara was a complete snob, and uh, I'm bouncing all about the place because I must not forget that Barbara wanted to marry Lord Mountbatten after Edwina died because Barbara had money and he didn't and he was very dexterous 
in avoiding all of her hints that they get married because Barbara would have loved nothing better than being Lady Mountbatten and it would have been rarely the feather in her cap but they remain great friends and he dodged that bullet uh, so to go back to Rain uh, there's stuff I know about her which I cannot say publicly because I know it privately. Uh, she was a great character. She was extremely capable. Uh, she had been a county councillor and the Prince Philip said if you want something done get Rain to do it. Mm -hmm. She was very capable but not only was she like a galleon in full sail, she was a battleship in full sail with guns blazing. She was, she didn't really like women. She had alliances with women. And uh, I think she was not very pleased when in my first Diana book, I quoted Margaret as saying, everybody hates rain, mm -hmm. <laughs> because Margaret said it. Uh, Barbara didn't mind me saying that funnily enough. Uh, but I think Rain was really put out that I'd said it because nobody liked Rain or very few people liked Rain. But because she was very capable and she was very bright and she could get things done and she was very social, uh, people associated with her because she was Lady Dartmouth then she became Lady Spencer and but despite all of that, Rain had her head in familial terms very well screwed on. Barbara told me, and William, Barbara's grandson and Rain's son, who's the present Earl of Dartmouth, confirmed it to me, that he had only ever met Diana twice at, by the time of her marriage because Rain deliberately kept the Spencer children separate from the Leg children. And Rain's comment was, those Spencer children are so poisonous, I don't want them corrupting my children. And therefore, she kept the two families completely separated for the whole of her marriage, mm -hmm. which was actually very wise of her. Because when Johnny Spencer died, Charles and Diana bundled up all her possessions, threw them into bin liners, and threw them out of Althrop House. So, although Rain and Diana ended up being friends towards the end of Diana's life, and Rain, to give her her due, you know, she let bygones be bygones, but also Rain was a woman who dealt with alliances and she was always going to form an alliance with the Princess of Wales, where the present previous made no difference. As far as she was concerned, Diana was her stepdaughter, she was still the Princess of Wales even if she was the former divorced Princess of Wales. And so it suited Rain because both Rain and Barbara functioned in a world where appearance was all. Mm -hmm. Well, actually not all, because both of them were very capable. Barbara made a whole load of money, and Rain actually ended up making quite a lot of money too. So I think that's Rain and Barbara. <laughs> nice. Oh, okay. Did you find it that interesting? Yes, I did. You did? Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's what the people are asking, so we have to say it. <laughs> and maybe we can put pictures of both Rain and Barbara. Could we put a picture of them on? No. Yeah, we could find a gap. Okay. okay. <laughs> we could find a gap to put a picture on, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> together or separate? Oh, I don't know that there'll be one of them together. Not true friends. Okay. <laughs> so yes, so for our next question today, do you know anything about Somerset Belenoff of Glam's Castle, the head of the Illuminati, who is supposed to be the cousin of the Queen? <laughs> 
what Illuminati? Is... Because apparently nowadays we've got 20 Illuminatis. <laughs> well, what is the Illuminati, first of all? For us young people, it's a it's a cult of rappers. <laughs> it is. Okay. Yeah, so... Because I gather that there is the theory that there is the Illuminati, which is a group of very powerful aristocrats and royals and billionaires and multimillionaires and mm. people like that who rule the world. Yes. <laughs> I gather from one or two people that I've even been called one on, on occasion as well, which is hysterical. Mm. I mean, I'd love to be able to, to rule myself, much less the world. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, fun and joke aside, she doesn't exist. I mean, with due respect, there's no such person as Somerset Melanoff. She's not the third cousin of the Queen. Uh, she does not live at Glam's Castle. Uh, Glam's Castle is where Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, was born. It's where Princess Margaret was born. Uh, Maggie Strathmore, who was the Queen Mother's great nephew, who was a great friend and professional colleague of James Buchanan Jardy, my ex, uh, was, you know, I I spent my 30th birthday up at Glam's uh, and they gave, they had a tea party for me, which was very sweet of them. I mean, I wasn't particularly friendly with the family. I was friendly with people who were friendly with the family, as opposed to me being personally friendly with them. But I knew some of them. Uh, Nike I knew pretty well. Uh, and he's dead now, but I have to say I liked Nike enormously. Uh, and I can tell you, because I know people who are neighbours of the Strathmores, and I've been to Glam's on more than one occasion. And there is no such person as Somerset Belenoff, never has been, never will be. It is a fabrication by God knows who. So, next question, honey. Of course. So for our final question today, do you think it's better for royalty to marry royalty and aristocracy or doesn't the newcomers, class, origins matter? Well, the old thinking was that royalty should marry royalty and not even aristocracy. Mm. And it worked very well. Still sort of happens. Bulls trying to get the rich to marry the rich still. Well, but that's not royalty to marry no. royalty. True. But it opens it up a bit, mm. of course. But you're right. Mm. It's basically... Uh, Introducing yeah. their children to the young... Yeah, yeah. The other young half of children. Yes. Hopefully they hook up and yes. carry on. But, of course, half the time, you children don't hook up. You, you find someone else to marry, and that's fine. Like with everybody. Yeah. You know, it's not about the money. I think nowadays for a lot of people, it's more about the kindness, mm -hmm. the happiness, and building a life together. <laughs> well, which is what it should be. But in the olden days, when mm. marriages were about, because girls didn't inherit money, uh, and if they did, the money was controlled by the husband. So it really was about position. Mm. So royalty married royalty, aristocracy married aristocracy, uh, and each class married into its own, and everybody knew what the code of behaviour was, and uh, in the aristocracy and the royal families, it was perfectly acceptable for somebody to look for their personal pleasures elsewhere after you had produced the requisite number of children mm -hmm. to secure the family line. Well, at the end of the First World War, all of this changed because up until the First World War, uh, royalty usually married royalty. They had started to, to marry into the aristocracy uh, which had caused a lot of problems in the European royal families because 
the European royal families had the tradition of morganatic marriages, which were marriages where royals could marry aristocrats or well-bred girls, and but they were not dynastic marriages. So the children of that marriage would not be royal. All of that changed at the end of the First World War, because up until then, the British royal family had to a large extent got its spouses from the German royal families. Well, after Germany lost the war, and the war had been such a bloodbath, it was no longer really acceptable for British royals to marry German princes or princesses. And George V and Queen Mary opened up things to allow their sons to marry aristocrats. And in fact, four of their children married aristocrats. Only one married a royal. The Duke of Kent married Princess Marina of Greece. And it actually was, to an extent, a love match. Uh, the Prince of Wales wanted to marry the Duke of Sutherland's daughter, Lady Melissa Lusengore, and King George V refused to allow the marriage, not because of her, but because her mother, Millicent, was notorious for giving her favours left, right and centre, and George V was a terrible prude. Uh, Bertie married Lady Elizabeth Boslan. Mm -hmm. So then uh, Prince Harry, who became the Duke of Gloucester, he married Lady Alice Montague Douglas Scott. And their daughter, their only daughter, Princess Mary, who became the Princess Royal, married Lord Lassells, who became Lord Harwood. So that's really when things changed. And the aristocracy, of course, understood the tradition of service. And they understood their ways were very similar to the royal ways. So everything still worked well. Come my generation, uh, it, things had loosened up even more. Prince Charles went out with some aristocrats. He went out with uh, other girls who were not aristocrats, but, but were upper class. And that was acceptable. Uh, and, but recently, because, I mean, Princess Anne did not marry an aristocrat. Mark Phillips was not an aristocrat, nor is her present husband who actually is descended from a Jewish family. They changed their name from Levy to Lawrence. So, uh, so they're not, and they're not Rothschilds or one of the Jewish aristocratic families. They're just an ordinary family. Uh, Prince Edward married Sophie Reese jones who's a solid middle-class girl. Uh, Prince William married Catherine Middleton, another solid middle-class girl, all of which has worked very well because the reality is most upper-class girls nowadays and certainly most aristocratic girls who already have titles don't want to marry into the British royal family because they do not want the constraints they do not want the attention. They want to be able to lead their lives without the scrutiny and the sacrifice that being a royal involves. My own opinion, having known some of these people, is that the best marriages for British royals would be any responsible girl or guy 
irrespective of their background, class or color-wise, who is decent, kind, reliable, and understands the concept of public service in a way that, say, Sophie Wessex or Catherine Cambridge do. Royalty fulfills a particular function in life. It has tremendous privileges, but it pays a tremendous price for them. What you cannot have is people entering the royal family who do not wish to make the sacrifice and who are prepared to use their royal position to benefit themselves. People who enter the royal family need to understand and that they are entering it to serve the nation. It is a cause greater than themselves. They should not be entering it to milk the opportunity for all it's worth and to exploit it for their personal glorification or self-aggrandizement. So it's not an easy question to answer, but I would say that most girls who marry into the royal family are, if they personally are not ambitious, their families are ambitious. I mean, there is the supposition that Carol Middleton is very ambitious and that Catherine Cambridge is a dutiful daughter who was brought up to fulfill the expectations of her mother and did it brilliantly. Mm -hmm. Well, you can't criticize her. She has done a wonderful job and I'm sure she'll make a wonderful queen and a wonderful princess of Wales. Sophie Wessex, who is lower down the food chain, has been an absolutely brilliant Countess of Wessex and she's going to be a wonderful Duchess of Edinburgh when the present Duke of Edinburgh dies and Prince Edward succeeds to the, his father's title. They understand what being royal is all about. It's a pity that Harry didn't understand, that Meghan didn't understand what royalty is all about. Because, but, you know, they have shot off on their own path and they have opened up the debate into com a completely new forum and it certainly helps to keep the monarchy relevant in terms of press attention. To what extent that is positive and to what extent it benefits the monarchy is open to question. But it certainly has made the monarchy far more topical as a subject mm -hmm. than it would otherwise have been had it just been those wonderful, dutiful girls who married to the family or uh, Princess Anne's husband, so it's not only the girls, it's the men as well, who marry into the royal family and do a really good job. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people would say, oh, well, they're doing such a good job that it's really rather boring. Mm -hmm. So we have not only the dutiful doing a good job in the background, but we also have the movers and shakers in the foreground. Do cha-cha, 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 I want everything. But it's certainly keeping the monarchy uh, on the front pages of the newspapers. Yes. So, <laughs> to an extent, they are serving a purpose which will hopefully not turn out to be detrimental to the interests of the monarchy. Mm. In my 27 years, I've never seen um, the monarchy being on the newspapers so much it's since true. she's been, uh, she's entered the royal family. Yeah. Yes. You're absolute. Well, of course, 
you would have the top little article mm. there and there, mm. quite every day as well, but not as much. No. Now it's every day, mm. only on the same person, mm. and drags in the other ones that just want mm. to be a bit more discreet. Yes. And they're getting dragged in because of one person. Yes. Well, I think, I think of course, you are too young to remember Diana. You don't remember no, Diana, do you? Diana. Of course, she died when you were oh, four. Yes, you were four when she died. Um, mm. But, you know, she was always on the front pages of the newspapers as well. Mm. So there is a certain amount of synchronicity because Megan has patterned herself in some respects off Diana. But Megan is a poor man's Diana uh, who has ambitions to be a rich man's Diana and maybe actually supersede Diana in every way. So, but, so you wouldn't remember that. And yes, it's it's almost it's almost too much isn't it yeah it's a bit a bit annoying to be honest yes i open youtube as well you have her face everywhere you open a newspaper she's there it's like what do we have to say about her again today what she done again you know yes and every day she does something new mm. but that's diana she studied diana because yes, i you understand said that in your yeah. previous video yeah and and Diana was brilliant at it, and she's brilliant at it as well. Mm. I mean, every day she pops up with something new. You know, yesterday it's interviewing Gloria Steinem. The day before, it's it's jumping on uh, the bandwagon with uh, Michelle Obama. Every day it's something, mm -hmm. and uh, you know she's very resourceful. You cannot deny the fact that the woman is extremely energetic and resourceful. Whether this is in the ultimate interests of the monarchy or not is another question. And on that note, I think we should say thank you very much and goodbye. And do let me know if you have enjoyed this sort of video uh, in your comments. And also, please keep the questions coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and we hope you enjoyed this episode too. So, if you keep on liking, keep on subscribing, keep on liking the videos, then pass it on to your friends, and that will help us out, and that will help us make more videos for you. Thank you. Bye bye.